So as of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, there are 11 Assassin's Creed protagonists, so I thought I'd rank them. Of course I did, because that's what we do here. A ludicrous amount of Assassin's Creed rankings, but to be fair, this one is fairly important. Unlike some, the IC protagonists range from offensively bad, offensively forgettable, or every now and then, one of the best characters in the entire medium. Of course, before I get into this, this is my opinion. If you guys think that Cassandra is a titan of quality writing in the gaming industry, that's okay. If you think Ezio is a Mary Sue, that's fine. That's okay. I don't mind that one bit. Anyway, Let's get into the list. Cassandra or Alexios, I'll say Cassandra since she's the canon protagonist, isn't a character because she doesn't have character. She doesn't have defining traits or dispositions distinct to her, nor is she a Fallout or Mass Effect type of protagonist where you are the protagonist, because the game has much more linearity in its story, and there's certain things Cassandra must do to get you from point A to point B. For example, in Legacy of the First Blade, you need to stay with your new partner because apparently Cassandra or Alexios feels connected to them, but throughout the game, you're a total sociopath. You're given dialogue options that can range from outrageously disloyal and immoral to ones that are more considerate, and as a result of this, any sort of emotion Ocean feels disingenuous and inconsistent purely because of how malleable Cassandra's options are. And that moment in Legacy of the First Blade where you stay with your new partner epitomises how shallow this facade of choices. The story is going to make you go one way or another because it's not designed around nor driven by its protagonist, so ultimately, nobody wins. You don't have a game that gives you full player choice, nor do you have one with an actual protagonist, just a soulless, poorly acted avatar that goes from place to place, just doing things because that's what the game requires, rather than having an actual character drive the story. Now Jacob, on the other hand, is a character. Too much of a character. Someone in the writer's room was given one too many Reddit awards on r slash dank memes and never let it go. That's what Jacob is. Reddit incarnate. How Jeffrey O'Harlan was the lead of this game after writing Brotherhood and both truth sections is mental to me. Anyway, Jacob. Jacob is the funny assassin, you see. His wit defines him. The only issue is, he's not funny. So you'd be trying to enjoy your time with Assassin's Creed Syndicate, arduous enough as is, and then this bastard comes out with some fucking Christmas cracker quip or anecdote, and you remember Assassin's Creed just wasn't allowed to have good writing for the better part of a decade. One note characters aren't an inherently bad thing, I'd say. They have their place in certain narratives or contexts, but in the context of Syndicate, a game that's set in perhaps the most grim period the series has touched, it doesn't work, and characters that are defined by one trait are never going to work in a serious character-driven narrative, which is what Assassin's Creed should deliver. There is this moment at the end of the game where he and Evie argue. It's the one time where any sort of conflict between the two rises to anything significant, and I can't really say I'm invested because I don't see Jacob as a character with emotions or stakes in anything. And that scene is brushed under the rug so you can do this epic boss fight with Staric, and the game ends with Jacob having no development whatsoever. And his and Evie's relationship is Another thing that I don't really think is explored very much, it feels like every exchange between the two exists so Jacob can fill his funny quota, or Evie can give some kind of exposition. They don't feel like siblings, more like strangers, and Jacob as a whole is emblematic of Syndicate's huge issues when it comes to tone. Now, number nine is Connor, who I'd put above Jacob because he's defined by more than just the one trait, but it's hard to really call him that deep of a character when all of his motivations are so empty, and he doesn't change whatsoever. Connor never gets a parting glass or bonfire of the vanities moment where there's clearly been some character progression or change of direction for this character. Connor ends the story as the 14 year old boy he was at the start, naive, headstrong, and cold. Now, I don't want Connor to be the exact opposite of what he was at the start, that doesn't constitute a satisfying arc, but the lack of an arc is probably worse. There was a lot to be done with Connor. His idealism and often blind optimism were interesting traits that none of the other protagonists really share, at least to that degree. And you have this story where Haytham isn't always right necessarily, but constantly proving to Connor that this somewhat deluded optimism 
isn't exactly well placed, and that naivety is just as present come the end of the game. Imagine if Connor took these lessons to heart and changed the colonial assassins for the better, or something that makes it feel like he's made some level of change. Connor's other big aforementioned issue is he just sort of drops his main motivation to get revenge, justice for the destruction of his home by killing the man responsible. When Connor finds out that George Washington was responsible, he doesn't really care that much because, hey, America is epic and George Washington was really cool. It's not even that he doesn't kill him, that would be the stupid choice in that situation because Lee would get his position, but that's not how it's presented. It's presented more as if Connor doesn't really care at all. And that's the excuse for him being so bland and underdeveloped, the burning of his village, and that doesn't make sense to me. Saying that Connor is emotionless and unchanged because of this trauma. In a better written game, that would be the catalyst for some genuine growth. Going through some sort of trauma doesn't excuse being boring. The two protagonists before Connor had plenty of it, but they're well written characters, so they don't just have no personality after the fact. And Connor is where AC3's awkward development really does shine through, especially when you consider the cut epilogue speech that would have actually signalled change. But as it stands, Connor is just very bland. Speaking of bland, number 8 is everyone's favourite maker of luck and morally grey anti hero, Shay Patrick Cormac. And I do say morally grey very loosely there. Shay is a protagonist unique in concept, being the only time we've played as an assassin turned Templar. And that's okay, that's not the issue, in fact I think having a game that focuses in on that conflict more than any other would be excellent. The clash of ideals that the Templars and Assassins have is one of the most fascinating parts of the entire series. The game before it, Black Flag, gave a genuinely compelling look in on the conflict, but Rogue deals with it in such a surface level manner that reflects onto Shay. Shay isn't much more than that, a rogue. He doesn't really have much of a character outside of that, and so when that conflict is nothing more than, well, the assassins are bad now and sometimes act more like Templars in Achilles' ambition and weird superiority complex, and it treats you like a child, like the side you're on is always good and the side that you're not is bad, it makes for a very dull, uninteresting story. And the reason I'm talking so much about this is because that's all Shay is really, the vessel of this conflict, and nothing more, and so when that conflict is so shallow, so is Shay. And his development is very surface level. He joins the Templars, sure, but what has actually changed within Shay? He doesn't really feel wiser, or as if he's learned anything, he's just this very flat character that embodies the concept of the game, as well as the sloppiness of its delivery, and nothing more. Also, his accent is fucking terrible. So next on the list is Evie, a character I think could have been quite good, you know, if not for James fucking Corden being shoved down her neck. I think Evie was okay. I find her curiosity and the way she looks at the assassins with this childlike wonder to be really interesting. It's a cool starting point for an intriguing Assassin's Creed story where our idealistic protagonist begins to see the flaws in the assassins and becomes maybe like a modern Nautier or a sceptical mentor. That's just one idea. Evie feels like an actual human character that something can be done with, and she feels like an actual assassin who cares about the tenets and the maxim of this creed unlike Jacob. But then in the final game, a lot of her missions are just sort of fixing Jacob's numerous fuck-ups instead of having any kind of interesting development of her own. And there really isn't much to say about Evie because there isn't much of Evie. She's sidelined for Jacob, and all that really remains are the blueprints of a potentially interesting character. But in the final product, I'm largely indifferent to. So now we're into the protagonists I can say that I do like. And number six, is Arno, who's one of the more tragic protagonists we've gotten living a life of loss and never really having a true home nor family for too long. It's a really cool concept that lends itself into some of the AC1-ish conventions of Unity, but it's never really explored too much until Dead Kings. Arno's story is kicked off really well, very clearly Ezio inspired, but it goes in an interesting direction. But then, unfortunately, he spends the rest of the game trying to fuck his sister. I don't care that he's adopted, it's fucking weird, and I'm not letting it go. Instead of them bouncing off of one another, Elise feels more like a roadblock to Arno's growth instead of an aid. But luckily enough, she dies, he has a bit of a cry, and comes back in Dead Kings as a depressed, grumpy man instead of a lovesick teenage boy, which is brilliant, really. Arno returns in Dead Kings as a full-on red-pilled assassin skeptic. That is a fucking terrible sentence. 
Arno feels very Altair-esque in this DLC. He's stoic, wise, and has grown to be very independent and critical. And it's a shame that Arno wasn't this consistently interesting throughout the entire game. He's a character who's fun to begin with, frustrating in the middle, but ends as quite a compelling one. So breaking us into the top five is the latest protagonist in the series, Eivor. Eivor is a character that I like a lot, but her resolution, at least in the main game, sort of let her down. Eivor at the beginning of the game is tethered to Sigurd, out for the typical life of a prosperous Viking, one of honour and glory. But by the end of the game, she's seen her share of tragedy, and not outgrown Sigurd necessarily, but is more independent. And one of the finest moments of the game, one of the most defining for Eivor, is when she leaves the simulation of Valhalla and basically defeats Odin's consciousness. And when he says, well, stay with me and you can have wisdom, glory, power, that's no longer what she needs, and she lets go because she needs everything else. And then you finish the Order of Ancients storyline with your ideals seemingly leaning more towards the Hidden Ones by the day, and when Hytham offers her a position, she says, no, I really like glory and fame, and you're just sort of a bunch of pussies. And you know what? There shouldn't be an Assassin's Creed game where you aren't an assassin, but that's not the main problem here. It's Eivor's reasoning. As of now, that is the last we've seen of her, and if she's not going to join the Hidden Ones, and you want to save that for the DLC, which I'm sure some UB executive does want to do, at least give her a reason that doesn't counteract her development over the course of this 60 hour game. Imagine if at the end of AC2, Ezio just murders Rodrigo and goes, yes, this will bring my family back, or if Edward just left Mary to die so he could go off and be a fucking privateer. That one's a bit more out there, but you get what I mean. It's so unsatisfying to have your protagonist go back to square one after the epilogue clearly sets a change of attitude and outlook in place. And that's why Eivor's fifth, because she's likeable and matures a lot and has an interesting journey, but that dialogue is so backwards, and I'm 90% sure it's there so Eivor can become an assassin in France to sell that as, you know, the full-on AC DLC, but that final conversation just leaves a sour taste in your mouth. I think Eivor's good, though. She is a bit of a blank slate, not entirely to the extent where she's totally uncharacterised, nowhere near that, but enough to cater to choice. And so she can feel quite passive and like a bit of a pushover at times, because you'll need to do things like lying to Richier in the Yorkshire arc, things that you don't necessarily want to do, nor would Eivor do, in my opinion, at least, but the story has to move that way, but on the whole, she is good. I like Abel. Bubakar Salim carries Assassin's Creed Origins on his back with one of the finest, most mature and honest performances we've seen from this series. Bayek is truly the heart of this game. The way Bayek deals with grief is heartbreaking and so totally human. And that's what I always come back to with Bayek, how human he is. That's not to say that Edward or Ezio aren't human, but characters like those also have a sort of Hollywood charm to them, especially Ezio. And that's not a bad thing, it's a part of their charm, but Boyek is a character that's not this glamorously presented badass who could take on the world. He's a grieving father who has frequent breakdowns and outbursts. He's a man that feels beaten and weathered. And I say man, not character, because Boyek probably feels like the most real protagonist in the series, and I cannot express how amazing Abubakar Salim's performance is. It's truly one of the best in the entire industry. He's got such a range and depth, and I totally buy this man as a playful and fatherly man as much as I buy him as a broken warrior clinging on to vengeance because it's all he has left of his son. It's rare that you come across a character as sympathetic and relatable as Boyek, and despite me not exactly being that fond of Origins, I will always love Bayek. So this general area of the fourth to second spot is fairly interchangeable for me. I love these characters immensely, and Altier is no different. He starts out sharing some traits with Connor, such as his arrogance, overconfidence, and short-sightedness, all of which change as Altier grows very subtly over the course of AC1, into a more just man who puts the creed above himself, and then going past that, he becomes so much more. Developing the three ironies and becoming a mentor who embodies a creed that isn't so immovable in its own logic. Corey May and Patrice Desolaire weren't afraid of making Altier unlikable to start. He is a fucking bastard the first time you see him. And not in this, like, he's a flawed but good-hearted guy kind of way either. The first time you see him, he kills an innocent man, breaks a life oath, 
and inadvertently gets a man he's meant to be loyal to killed and another amputated. OTA's writing doesn't treat you like a child who isn't going to be able to read into any kind of nuance like so many protagonists since. And as OTA begins to understand the scope and seriousness of the hunt for the nine targets, he grows and learns and come to the end of the game he heeds the teachings of the Brotherhood and embodies a Levantine assassin, and even after that, Altier is far from perfect, as we see with his anger getting the best of him, killing Swami and his wife dying in the process. Altier was a near-perfect protagonist for the game he was in, and I will always appreciate his very incremental growth, where there isn't necessarily these huge turning points, but these tiny catalysts that push Altier into becoming one of the most respected and compelling characters in the AC universe. We haven't got a protagonist as great as Edward Kenway since his debut, and his progression from a self-serving pirate into a family man trying to be better is unbelievably compelling. I love this homage to AC2 at the start of the game where Edward puts on Duncan Walpole's robes, comparing him to Ezio. Edward has just stolen the uniform of a man he's recently murdered, hoping to chase a fortune. While Ezio dons Giovanni's robes out of a sense of honour, and duty, two traits that aren't particularly applicable to Edward. And as the game goes on, he just gets battered over and over again as a result of this obsession with achieving something greater than himself and having some money to his name. His goals to begin with are very understandable and relatable, but Edward's obsession with the observatory makes him so narrow-sighted that he's blindsided when he loses all that he loves. And the fact that it takes so much death and misfortune for him to change his ways is truly tragic. And I love that Edward gets to fulfil his goal of being something more than himself with the Creed, a group who he once saw as silly now seems virtuous because of how much this consistent loss has morphed his worldview. It's fucking poetry. Darby McDevitt, what a guy. Edward is such a phenomenal protagonist and one of my favourites of this entire console generation. Also, Matt Ryan performs Edward so well. I couldn't see anyone else in the role and I feel he does get overshadowed by Roger and Abu a fair bit. He's brilliant and excellently brings this amazing character to life. So number one is my favourite character of all time, my comfort character, Ezio Auditore da Firenze, and across the entire trilogy, he is written flawlessly. To begin with, he's a 17-year-old reckless noble who values honour, family, and pride, values we can all consider important. And AC2 takes its time to flesh these out, as well as Ezio's relationships and rivalries. It gives you 45 minutes or so to familiarise yourself with who this teenager is and what he cares about before that's all taken from him. Throwing him into a life of violence and duty where those characteristics of honour, family and pride still persist. He's an imperfect character who is constantly learning and making mistakes. A lot of people in the last few years have been saying Ezio is perfect and doesn't make mistakes and is boring for that. I'm sorry, but if you genuinely think Ezio doesn't make mistakes, you can't have been paying attention. His naivety causes him to place trust in Uberto de Fria's family, who in turn kills them. He's framed and hunted for the death of the Doge. He loses the apple multiple times. Even in Revelations, he kills Tarek accidentally, a man who fought for the same cause. And that's not even getting into the end of AC2. By the end of the game, Ezio isn't totally consumed by vengeance, and killing Rodrigo isn't his sole purpose anymore, so he doesn't kill him. And this is a brilliant moment. It's not meant to be righteous or the smart thing to do, it's meant to be the choice Ezio would somewhat selfishly make, resulting in the attack on Monteregioni and the subsequent death of Mario. Even in wanting to be a good person who does the right thing, he fucks up, and his journey is such a compelling one because even in the twilight of his life, he's imperfect. He's always learning, trying to be the best man he can, and living by the values he holds dear. He's a very relatable human character that isn't as raw as Bayek, nor totally on the Hollywood action hero side of things, but a perfect combination, resulting in a character that is real and has these visceral moments, but is also charming, charismatic, and badass. He's truly the king of video game characters, and the best the series has given us. Anyway, that's just my list. You guys are bound to disagree, and if you do, you can let me know. And uh, yeah, I hope you always enjoyed it. If you did, maybe leave a like, and if you didn't, maybe let me know why. I'll see you guys next time in another Assassin's Creed video.